The material in this video was originally prepared for and presented at a meeting of the Extramural Research and Training Centers funded by the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health on July 26th through the 28th of 2022. The theme of this meeting was preparing for the future of worker safety, health, and well-being through innovations in training, research, and practice. This meeting brought together occupational safety and health research, academic, and practitioner communities to consider the most pressing issues and explore opportunities for collaboration to help prepare for the impact of the future of work on occupational safety and health for the nation. We hope you enjoy the following presentations. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Early Career Scientist Quick Take session. This morning, we'll be hearing from eight early career scientists as they give us five-minute overviews of their current projects. And I'll be giving the presenters a reminder on the time at the five-minute point. For their full biographies, please check out the Center's Meeting website. And if we have any time left over at the end of the session, then we'll open it up for questions and answers. So please leave any questions until the end of the session. So now let's get started with a presentation from Elena Austin at the Pacific Northwest Agricultural Safety and Health Center. My name is Elena Austin, and I'm an investigator with the University of Washington Pacific Northwest Agricultural Safety and Health Center, or PNASH. Today, I'll be presenting a quick overview of some of our recent efforts within the center to promote dairy partnerships in the Pacific Northwest and to develop novel injury prevention research. Projects presented here were led by Dr. Michael Yost, myself, and Dr. Amber Adams Progar, and include examples of on-farm interventions, development and evaluation of novel online courses, and leadership training efforts. Our first approach was to understand the extent of injury impacts in the sector through the analysis of workers' compensation data. Workers' compensation claims data show dairy workers have a higher injury rate than workers in other industries. In addition, as compared to other industries, there has been a clear increase in injury claims over the last decade. Through data requests to the Washington State Department of Labor and Industries, we obtained an eight-year de-identified case-level data set of dairy claims presented here. Within the dairy industry, there were a total of 3,688 claims for compensable and non-compensable injuries reported. Over this time period, there is a statistically significant 23% increase in the overall rate of reported injuries. When we compare injury rates in all Washington state industries, as well as other agricultural sectors, for example, here I'm presenting the trends observed in the tree fruit industry and all Washington state industries, we do not see the same trends in reported injury rates. We then delved more deeply into the case level injury data within dairy. We found that industry specific risks include acute injuries from animal assaults, slips and falls on wet surfaces and chronic injuries from repetitive stress. As with total injuries, there were increased rates of cattle related injuries as well as slips, trips and falls over this time period. We reported the injury findings to our partners, in particular, the Washington State Dairy Federation, an industry group representing independent producers in our state. And they identified the need to evaluate the effectiveness of different on-farm training approaches. To do this, we designed a training intervention study where we recruited workers at three Washington dairies to participate in either a panache-designed interactive dairy training or a previously designed video-based training. Both were offered in Spanish and in person. Over the course of this study, we trained a total of 162 workers, typically in groups of 20, on animal handling and slips, trips, and falls prevention. We saw significant improvement in the pre and post intervention scores for both video based and interactive based training. However, after adjusting for baseline performance, we saw no difference in improvement by training type. On farm activities were limited after COVID 19, and we were unable to continue investigating the impact of other on farm training approaches. We then went back to the case level data. And if you'll recall, over one third of the injuries reported in this industry are cattle related to look at the specific types of injuries that were occurring. And we found uh, four predominant types, injuries to the hands, injuries to the chest, um, catastrophic multiple body part injuries and injuries to the head, not shown here. A better understanding of the impact and nature of animal related injuries on dairy workers led to the development of a unique train the trainer program, Leaders Enabling Advanced Dairy Safety, or LEADS, 
which certifies managers and owners to offer on-farm animal handling training specifically designed to promote worker and animal safety. This training program was created from the injury claims data we discussed above. The training was designed to increase awareness of the four most common cattle-related injuries on dairies and offer recommendations on how dairy managers and owners can minimize the risk of these injuries. It also includes communication and leadership training components. The data-based nature of this program, coupled with its focus on injury prevention, makes the LEADS training program unique. The program has successfully trained 47 Washington participants since 2019, representing 16 different Washington State dairies. Upon completion of the LEADS training, each participant received copies of all the training materials to take back to their respective farms and share with their coworkers. Based on program assessments, 100% of LEADS participants learned something new and 86% plan to use the LEADS training materials on their farms. On average, participants increased their knowledge of dairy cattle handling safety by 20%. Outreach to program graduates indicated the need for more support in offering on-farm training for participants. In order to respond to this need, the Washington State Dairy Federation, WSU and UW have collaborated to develop the eLearning Dairy Safety Kit platform which provides curated content and an interactive learning experience tailored to Washington dairy workers. The Dairy Safety Toolkit is intended for use by dairy owners and managers of Washington dairy farms, and it's available online through an e-learning platform. There are currently 12 learning modules that present topics such as developing effective prevention programs, animal handling, and prevention, prevention of sexual harassment. The portal has been ongoing since 2019 and currently has 43 active users. The development of this toolkit was a joint effort of the Panache Center, Washington State University Animal Sciences, and the Washington State Dairy Federation. Participation of the Washington State Dairy Federation was directly funded through a Safety and Health Investment Projects grant from the Washington State Department of Labor and Industries. We are currently planning to extend the reach of our safety effort and include Oregon and Idaho to develop a regional approach to safety. I invite you to reach out to me, Alina Austin, if you have any questions or comments on this presentation, and encourage you to connect with the Panache Center through uh, the links offered below. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now we'll have a presentation by Shannon Gio Wright from the Southwest Center for Agricultural Health, Injury Prevention, and Education. Thank you so much, y'all. So this presentation is titled, this is the type of jobs the majority of immigrants have to get, which comes directly from a quote from one of our immigrants who we were working with on a slips, trips, and falls project. So funding support from this came from the Southwest Center for Agricultural Health, Injury Prevention and Education, and then also an IPA agreement through NIOSH. The advisory council that we had was full of an amazing group of people who um, are leaders in the industry, managers at Fishing Dots, um, research managers, physicians, seafarer centers, sea grant representatives, and we're really grateful um, for all of them. So our methodology, and it looks like it's um, a little messed up on the screen, but I'm going to walk through it, um, is that we, our efforts are guided by CBTR, so that's community-based participatory research. And that's really a relational model that values the participants as equal partners in research, dissemination, and implementation. So at the process level, communities are engaged throughout data collection, analysis, and interpretation. And then in the outcome phase, they really play a significant role in moving our research findings um, to practice. And I'll go into that um, in more depth. And then we also did qualitative um, methodologies using semi-structured interviews. We had 59 participants, participant observation over 53 hours. And we had 18 participants in focus groups. And then we also used photo voice, which is another CBPR method where we get participants cameras to ask them to take photos of their lives. I mean, and then we go through that and interview them with the photographs. And we handed out 15 of those with four returned so far. So quickly, some of the results that um, we had whenever we were working with um, Gulf Coast shrimpers um, at the docks was that um, access to healthcare was a huge issue. So 
Um, many of them had little, if any, health care in the U.S. Um, in the Rio Grande Valley in Texas, many of them would go to Mexico to seek health care. In Southeast Texas, um, many of them, um, in, in Rio Grande Valley, mainly Spanish speaking, in Southeast Texas, mainly Vietnamese population, um, neglected primary care almost entirely. Safety was also um, another issue, but what was interesting about it was um, many of them talked to us about having an understanding of danger, um, but then they wouldn't necessarily take life-saving precautions um, whenever we would ask them about, you know, do you wear a personal flotation device? And so they would tell us, you know, yes, all jobs have risks, but this one just has a lot more. And one person told us this is the type of job the majority of immigrants have to get. That's just the way it is. Um, and so each person discussed this, but then uh, many would say they wouldn't wear a PFD because they couldn't get their work done if they were to wear it because of its size. And then mental health. So mental health is something, um, many of this stemmed from loneliness, um, past trauma, limited access to housing, for healthcare. And um, so we saw a lot of this, um, people being away from families, they saw self-medication, and that um, oftentimes ended up you know, leading to substance use, especially related to opioid use. And we had to you know, cancel some interviews sometimes because the participants weren't able to communicate with us. And people told us it was difficult to get way, used to this way of life, physically and mentally. Um, one person said, the Americans say you're homesick because that's what hurts the most. We don't see our kids. And someone else said, you're surrounded by water. It's as if you were in jail. So what we did with this and what I really want to focus on today is that, um, you know, we did all of these interviews. We took the data. We worked with the fishermen. We spent hours and hours at the docks and throughout Texas trying to get to understand their, um, the issues that they were having. And so we originally were going into this wanting to understand how do we prevent slips, trips, and falls. And what we were able to uh, really see and, and experience when working with um, the fishermen was that, yes, they understood the dangers of some strips of falls, but many of them um, don't have access to any type of health care. And so what we wanted to do was to respond to their immediate needs, which is a CBPR community-based participatory approach. And so they asked us for some type of a health clinic or some type of access to um, primary health care. So what we did is we provided accessible health and social services um, for this population to really address their socioeconomic needs, um, which we hope you know, prevents future medical conditions and injuries. So we really looked at this as a Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So we wanted to address their immediate needs um, as requested by them, and um, so that we could build trust and we could build rapport to then address their uh, major causes of the fatal injuries, such as such trips and falls. So in one year, we've seen over 180 fishermen at the docks. Um, at least one person has been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. Five have been sent to a clinic for tests. And we've had somebody immediately admitted to the hospital and somebody else was diagnosed with high blood pressure and transported to a local free clinic. And he later received follow-up care and medication. And you'll see some of the photos here of the clinic that we do. We, we do it right on the docks. Um, what's been you know, interesting is that we originally were just going to do this one-time clinic and the need was so great and they were so um, thankful for it that we started doing the clinic um, once a month. And so we've been doing it every single month, every, the first part of every month and since July of last year. And we have you know, everything from BP and heart rate to antibiotics to medic medication. And we recently were able to add dental exams um, as well as mental health professionals, which was directly um, asked by the fishermen as well as having fresh fruit and food out there. And then, um, you know, focusing on recommendations, um, you know, we really want to look at the structural and social aspects of this. So realizing that you know, being able to provide this service is great, but we also want to think of long-term policy implications um, that we can 
focus on when it comes to universal health care, um, as well as uh, you know, PFDs that you know, fishermen can wear that would be safer. So there's many different levels to this um, that we really want to be able to pull out long term um, from the research. Another recommendation is to really ensure that our research is community-based and community-led. We went out there with one purpose and we're able to see something completely different because we listen to and work closely with the community. And that CDPR methods, when applied to high-risk settings with hard to reach populations, really has the ability um, to improve health and to prevent injury. For any other information, I know my microphone might not be great and my, my sound's a little off. I'm at a hotel right now, so I apologize. I'm doing the best I can here. Um, but if you want to dig in a little bit more, we have um, a um, recently published article that you can um, look up. It's open access and you can read more about um, how we were able to create this clinic with the fishermen. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Shannon. And next, we're going to have a presentation by Lily Muncy at the University of Washington. Good morning, and thank you, everyone. It's great to be here. Uh, my name is Lily, and I am with the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences here at UW. And today, I'm going to be walking you through our mentorship program for construction women working in construction, and specifically the sheet metal trade. So to give you a little overview of what I'll be discussing today um, is first really the need for mentorship amongst tradeswomen, um, as well as a, our mentorship training program that cons is consisted of um, uh, asynchronous and synchronous um, uh, training elements, and as well as some of our training evaluation from our mentors, as well as directions for future research. So this is a little schematic of our um, uh, randomized control trial, which shows that we have um, participating locals from um, Smart International, but all over the country. And so half of these were included um, in our intervention arm of the study and half in our control arm. And those in our intervention arm participated in our mentorship program. So we worked with locals from across, um, from across the US to recruit journey level tradeswomen and uh, match them with apprentice level tradeswomen. And really the need for this came out of um, pilot research that we did here in Washington state, showing that there are specific psychosocial hazards as well as physical hazards that women on work sites face um, at work, things like uh, on the physical side, ill-fitting PPE or lack of sanitary bathrooms, and on the psychosocial side, things like harassment, um, aggression, um, and uh, sexual harassment specifically. So um, part of what we heard from previous tradeswomen participants in pilot research where we conducted mentorship is that Disseminating a mentorship program more widely to focus on leadership skills and supporting apprentice tradeswomen who are just coming into the trade is an effective way to um, help um, increase leadership skills amongst everyone in, um, in locals and improve uh, workplace safety outcomes and hopefully also increase retention and workplace culture in the longer term. So as you'll see here, this is a map of our intervention and control locals. So those with blue stars are those who are part of our intervention arm. Those uh, that are represented with yellow dots are part of our control arm. So we are tracking um, apprentice tradeswomen in all of these locals, but at this point, we are only delivering the mentorship program to those in our intervention arm. So those in our control arm will receive the intervention at the conclusion of the study in 2024. And to give you a little bit more information about what our mentorship training really consisted of, um, we wanted this to be as um, accessible and you know, efficiently available to mentors as possible, especially because we're delivering it in the midst of a pandemic. So we wanted to focus on leadership skills like active listening, um, communication, problem solving, self-advocacy, 
And it, to do this, we um, developed an all asynchronous training program that could stand on its own, but complemented this with synchronous Zoom sessions led by a trained facilitator. And here are a few stills from our asynchronous training, which shows that we had video elements, um, audio elements, problem-based scenarios for mentors to work through to help um, discuss what these leadership skills are, their importance, and to help contextualize them within the workplace. And so in terms of mentor training feedback from our training process, uh, a few of the things that we heard is that it would be helpful to learn, you know, how to overcome the issue with mentees of, I don't really need a mentor right now. This was something we heard from a lot of mentors as um, a challenge as they were connecting with mentees, especially early on in their mentor-mentee relationships. Um, we also had a tradeswoman stakeholder who was part of our Zoom synchronous sessions with mentors as part of our training. And she was able to really share her perspective as a tradeswoman, also as a leader and now an instructor with the international um, and share specific scenarios that she was put in, how she dealt with them, how she coped with them and, and skills that she has developed since then that she was able to pass on to our mentors. Um, so we heard a number of comments about the meaning of having someone who really understands the industry from the inside and understands what it's like to be a tradeswoman. Um, and that, that we really could see was of great value to our participants. In terms of our training evaluation, um, we did see that overall our mentors showed or um, told us that their overall confidence as a mentor increased as a result of the training, um, as well as the fact that it was effective in advancing an understanding of what really a mentoring relationship is. Um, about 23 mentors went through our training program, and the sample represented here is of 20 of our mentors who completed the mentor training program. In terms of future research, and as we think about where to take future tradeswomen research and mentorship work more broadly within the industry, um, one thing we're working on now is a qualitative assessment of what we can do to improve the training based on what our mentors experienced and based on their knowledge and expertise of the field. So we are conducting a qualitative assessment now to see where, where can we make the training better, what more, what other elements would be helpful to other journey level women who might participate in this training in the future. Um, as well as thinking about dissemination and implementation of the mentorship program more broadly, whether this is across all genders, more trades, certainly with our control locals at the conclusion of the study, but really looking at you know, the impact of existing programs like women's committees or local specific mentorship programs, female representation, um, as well as how we can better implement this and how we can see some of the longer term outcomes like increased retention and um, improved workplace culture down the road with disseminating these and uh, working these into workplaces in a longer term scenario. So that's all I have for today, but I'm happy to answer questions if we have time and I appreciate um, getting to be here this morning. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Lily. And next we'll have Grace Barlett at the Center for Construction Research and Training. Well, hi, everyone. My name is Grace Barlett, and I'm a research analyst at CPWR with the Research to Practice team. Um, as the National Construction Center, CPWR provides support for initiatives that are put forth by the three NORA Constructor Sector Council workgroups, which is falls struck by and COVID-19. Um, often we develop resources, assist with dissemination, and participate in national safety and health campaigns. Um, but today I'm going to discuss two examples of research support that CPWR's research to practice team um, has provided these work groups. So the first example involves a pilot study we're currently working on with the Struck by Work Group, which will use techniques from behavioral economics. So behavioral economics is a field of study that combines insights from psychology and economics to understand how people make decisions 
and it uses techniques such as nudges to help people make better decisions about their health and safety. You can learn more by reading CPWR's literature review, which is available on our website. The Struck by Work Group expressed interest in applying these techniques to um, improve the likelihood and quality of pre-job and pre-task planning to prevent struck by incidents, uh, which are the leading cause of non-fatal injuries in the construction industry and the second leading cause of death. So CPWR is currently developing a pilot program to assist contractors and workers in the planning process through guided questions and prompts, uh, resources on specific struck by hazards, and reinforcement activities, nudges, or reminders that can be incorporated all together or piecemeal based on the needs of that contractor and job site. So we're gonna be rolling out and testing this program with contractors of various sizes over the next year or so. So to get a better idea of where to start and what should be included in the planning program, earlier this year, we conducted a survey on work practices and barriers to preventing struck by incidents. Uh, so some of the key findings from the survey were that the primary causes of struck by in injuries were working around heavy equipment or vehicles um, and falling and flying objects from heights or on the same level. Measures used most often to protect workers were training, restricting access to the work area, and using PPE. And the top barriers to implementing controls for struck by hazards were a lack of training, scheduling pressure, or an emphasis on production, and lack of understanding of how to address hazards. In addition, uh, respondents indicated training or information is needed on how to identify and prevent struck by hazards, conducting a job hazard analysis, and what is working on other job sites to prevent struck by hazards. Finally, um, toolbox talks, training programs, and posters were identified as the most effective ways to raise awareness and ensure safe practices. So a complete report of these findings is gonna be posted on our website soon. We're also beginning recruitment of contractors to get feedback on the development of the program, and we're gonna pilot test it on their job sites. So the second example I'd like to talk briefly about is survey research that was conducted in support of the NOR Constructor Sector Council Falls Work Group and the National Campaign to Prevent Falls in Construction. So falls are the leading cause of death in construction despite being preventable. So a fall experience survey was developed by CPWR with support from the Falls Work Group, ANSI Z359 National Work at Heights Task Force, and other organizers of the Falls Campaign. Um, to improve our understanding of underlying causes of falls in order to inform ASSP and ANSA volunteer standards, create more relevant resources and materials in support of the falls campaign and national safety stand down, um, improve CPWR outreach and education efforts, influence future research on fall safety, and also share data with industry to improve collective fall prevention efforts. So, we received 671 responses. Of these, 495 said they've been involved in, witnessed, or investigated a fall incident. So we learned a lot from the survey, um, and a report is currently being finalized that is going to be posted on our website. But some key findings include that uh, respondents believe that lack of adequate planning is a key underlying cause of falls. Um, a lack of planning is also associated with the lower likelihood of using fall protection. At the time of the fall, nearly half uh, were not wearing fall protection. Employees' beliefs about their company's fall protection policy are strongly associated with the use of fall protection. So respondents who believed fall protection was required by their employer um, were eight times more likely to use fall protection compared to those who did not believe fall protection was required. Rescue training may help reduce fall-related deaths. So the odds of a fall being fatal were 76% lower for those who had self-rescue training compared to those who do not have this training. Um, and finally, workers employed by subcontractors face an elevated risk of dying from falls. So we're already using these survey findings to inform our work. Um, and our next step is engaging an expert panel with knowledge of what's going on in the industry related to fall safety. Um, so we're going to work with this panel to first select a solution that CPWR 
and the falls work group will disseminate over a specific period of time and then later to determine whether there was any visible increase in the industry and in implementation of that solution. Uh, thank you and please feel free to email me if you have any questions. Great, thank you, Grace. So next we'll hear from Leslie Ann Kiros Alcala at Johns Hopkins University. Good morning, everyone. Um, and uh, today I'll be talking about occupational chemical exposures among hairdressers of color. This work was funded in part by our internal ERC pilot program. So really briefly, what do we know about chemical exposures among hairdressers? Well, we know that despite the fact that there's over 600,000 hairdressers in the US alone, the majority of which are female, this is also a, a predominantly low wage workforce and with a lot of women of reproductive age, there are very limited studies on indoor salon exposures. In addition, epidemiologic findings to date have been limited and are inconsistent with regards to different outcomes, including reproductive health. A lot of these studies have also been conducted mostly in Europe with a lot of the studies relying on occupational title to assess exposure. So there's very limited data on chemical exposures in this highly understudied and underrepresented workforce. In addition, data on exposures and health risk among workers serving a racially and ethnically diverse clientele is currently lacking. And this is of concern because products that are marketed for use among women of color contain many harmful ingredients and the use patterns in this demographic is very different. We know that women of color, including black and Latina women tend to use a greater variety of products and with greater frequency that are marketed to this uh, unique uh, demographic. And we also know from CDC biomonitoring data or NHANES data that women of color tend to have higher exposures to chemicals that are present in a lot of hair and skincare products or beauty products. And so this led us to ask the question, well, if women of color in general have higher exposures to chemicals that are present in a lot of these beauty products, uh, for, you know, from personal use, what about women who are not only using them for personal use, but also might be exposed um, in their workplace? And so what did we se seek to do? Well, we conducted a pilot study in which we characterize indoor air quality as well as concentrations of indoor air pollutants such as volatile organic compounds or VOCs as well as particulate matter in six different hair salons primarily serving Black or African American uh, clientele as well as Latino clientele and conducted by monitoring of study participants. Specifically, we conducted by monitoring on 23 hairdressers from these six hair salons and had a comparison group of 17 office workers who were female and racially and ethnically similar to our hairdressers. We did measure different things. We measured PM, 14 VOCs in air, 28 VOC biomarkers, nine phthalate VOC biomar uh, phthalate biomarkers. We conducted untargeted analysis to see what other chemicals would be present in the hairdresser and office workers' urine. And we also took nasal microbiome samples. However, today I'll only focus on the biomonitoring results. So what did we find? Well, we found that Despite our small uh, sample size of hairdressers, sorry, this is animated and it's, there we go. So despite our small sample size of 23 hairdressers, we found that close to 50% of them reported working while pregnant. And in fact, two of the hairdressers were in their third trimester when, the, when they were participating in our study. And this is important because hairdressers are exposed to a mixture of chemicals, many of which are endocrine disrupting compounds and are recognized or suspected uh, reproductive toxicants. And this also represents not only a women's health issue, but also a children's health issue because these are women that are being exposed during critical windows of vulnerability, including the preconception period, prenatal period, as well as uh, postnatal period when they're uh, nursing. In addition, um, hairdressers were predominantly low income, most of the participants were non-smokers and hairdressers reported using more beauty products and seeking more salon services compared to office workers. So this uh, implies you know, a greater chemical uh, burden from use of these products and services. So here we see the distribution of concentrations for different phthalate biomarkers. Pink represents the distribution of concentrations for hairdressers, whereas blue reflects the concentrations observed in office workers. And we're finding that 
uh, for a lot of these phthalates, biomarker concentrations are much higher in hairdressers compared to office workers. For example, for MEP, we are finding that geometric mean concentrations in hairdressers were 10 times higher than those observed in office workers. Now, for MEP compared to women in the general U.S. population of the same age range as our hairdressers, here we have uh, red represents women in the U.S. population and blue represents our hairdressers, and we found that median concentrations were four times higher than women in the U.S. And compared to other studies in the published literature, we found that median concentrations in hairdressers for this biomarker were anywhere between two to 41 times higher compared to other studies. Now, this is a potential concern because the parent compound for MEP, which is diethyl phthalate or DEP, has been linked to adverse reproductive effects. Here we have urinary VOC biomarker concentrations. Again, pink reflects hairdressers, blue office workers. And we're finding that despite our small sample size, we found highly significant differences or higher concentrations of VOC biomarkers in our hairdressers compared to office workers as we can see here for different uh, VOC metabolites. Now, we also found significant differences in VOC biomarker concentrations between workers in you know, catering to a black clientele versus a Latino clientele. Here we have uh, the distribution of concentrations in blue represents uh, black hairdressers and green represents uh, hairdressers working in Latino salons. And we can see here that uh, VOC biomarker concentrations tend to be higher among black hairdressers. And this is potentially due to different products and services that are being provided in these salons. Now there's been a big push in recent years uh, for you know, encouraging women of color to go natural because it's perceived to be less toxic, less chemical intensive, and even chemical free. And so we did ask about different natural hair services. And in this figure, uh, we have here on the x-axis VOCs for which we measure different biomarkers. And on the y-axis, we see different uh, products or services or even PPE use that we asked about a plus, basically, is saying that we found a significant uh, positive correlation, so higher concentrations of biomarker concentrations for those reporting using these products or providing these services. Uh, and then if it's in a purple box, it means it was statistically significant, but I'm not too concerned about that, or we shouldn't be because it's a small sample size. Um, and so we see here that even natural hair services were associated with higher exposures to many of these uh, VOCs that we measured. We also found that wearing masks was associated with lower exposures to many of these VOCs. However, this needs to be explored further. So our study was highlighted in our School of Public Health magazine in the environmental health series, uh, sorry, environmental justice series. So you can read more here where I provided the link and they also did a video where they all where they interviewed uh, one of our hair salon owners or participants who you see here. And I wanna conclude with that and acknowledge all of the funders, the students and volunteers, as well as my collaborators. And thank everybody here for uh, the opportunity to present this work. Great, thank you, Leslie Ann. Next, we have Brett Perkinson from University of Texas. Hi, thanks so much for uh, inviting me to speak today on this uh, important topic. Uh, today, I'm gonna be presenting an ongoing research project that I'm leading that is developing an e-learning tool uh, in the area of disaster preparedness with em specific emphasis on health effects that construction workers working in flooded environments are at risk for. So the beginning of the development of our project really goes back to August 2017 when Hurricane Harvey affected over 8 million people in the Texas coastal area, uh, especially the city of Houston. Uh, in the weeks after the storm, our ERC center developed an outreach program that centered on two main projects. One monitoring areas uh, affected for soil and water contamination, and the one I helped lead was distributing personal protective equipment and safety instructions uh, to construction workers and residents uh, who were tearing down and repairing their homes. Um, we were able to obtain donations and to be able to assemble 3,000 kits composed of N95 masks, gloves, 
uh, instructions in English and Spanish on how to safely clean flooded homes and how to properly put on an N95 mask. And then we assembled a group of volunteers of, of staff, faculty, and students from the school. We tapped into a large network of churches, neighborhood associations, uh, and worker advocacy groups to distribute these masks at 19 different sites across Harris County. And you can see those are in, in yellow. And you can see there's a strong association of, uh, we really focused on areas that were of lower socioeconomic status that were heavily uh, impacted by the flood. Um, six months later, um, participants who had signed up to talk to us at the time were contacted by telephone to inquire as to their state of health, the effectiveness of our intervention, and how well they had been able to recoup from the storm. And we subsequently pub published the results of this follow-up study uh, for our outreach program. And that's just a few pictures of us out in the field. So what did we learn? Uh, the results from, from this study show that there are significant health risks associated with cleanup, uh, particularly respiratory. We had a large increase in respiratory symptoms uh, in workers who, and in residents who were affected by the storm. Uh, there is very limited safety training for workers. Many of these workers in these natural disaster settings have had very little previous training on, on the health hazards. Uh, something that came up that we hadn't realized until we talked to workers that they're high risk for ex exploitation risks. Uh, for wage theft and security. And that's always an issue in construction, but particularly after natural disasters. And there are numerous logistical challenges as far as uh, providing pr uh, personal protective equipment, um, uh, basic, basic necessities of, of food and water when you're out there at these sites. So as a result of this, um, uh, th this provided the basis for my project funded by phase one small business innovation research grant uh, which was funded by NIHS. And our project uh, goes by the, the rather long name of Agile Development of Innovative, Interactive, Hazard Recognition and Mitigation Tools and Learning e-platforms for workers involved in the rescue and recovery operations in diverse flooding environments, uh, which we are. What we realized is, is that there's a critical need for a single e-learning tool that provides assistance for workers going into a disaster prone area that can be used in the pre-deployment phase where you have for workers uh, a readiness assessment to see if they've received that training and how competent they are. And then a health assessment for medical screen to make sure that they're able to go in these often unstable environments. Furthermore, a deployment setting uh, in the midst of a disaster uh, to have in, improved coordination of activities, improved uh, communication, as I mentioned, resource coordination and specific hazard identification. And then in a post-deployment post setting where we're continually monitoring workers uh, for the health effects they might've incurred uh, during this phase. We have designed a, um, uh, a program that's a coordinator for def defining worksite scenarios, recruiting and evaluating readiness and for the worker themselves, uh, to create action plans and deployment and on-site tools for them to use while they're actually working. I've got just a few slides here that show uh, uh, some, some screenshots of our, of our prototype for pre-deployment. So you can see here where we ask uh, the, uh, in the worker for the names of the, of the site location, a way to negotiate wages um, uh, to, to provide some security against wage theft, and then a few basic medical screening questions um, to, to inquire if there's any, any issues that are at risk. Uh, we've also fully incorporated security features into this. We realize that with medical privacy, that this is an issue, particularly if you have a modules for both managers and, and workers, and uh, all of these are optional um, if the workers opt not to segments. Um, this is for the deployment setting where you can see for a particular type of work where they're going in, we, we can identify specific what types of equipment that they need in terms of respirator, gloves, boots. Um, we discussed uh, some about vaccines. Part of our grant was also uh, had a COVID-19 supplement that we talk a little bit about infectious diseases. Um, and you can also see it identifies uh, for the worker where the job site is and where the pickup site is. Uh, so that there is a backup system for, for this work in case they're not picked up 
uh, in a timely fashion in these areas. We really believe that this, this uh, tool has got a, a wide range of uses for a variety of stakeholders. And so we have vetted this with a, with, with a variety of people, including uh, uh, NIOSH, uh, community organizer, av advocacy organizations, and have some of their feedback into Talk at Arc and will continue to do so. We think it has a lot of applications uh, for a lot of fields related to natural disasters. Our project roadmap is we're currently have completed phase one, uh, where we have uh, piloted this with a group of construction workers, our prototype, and uh, we'll be publishing the results of that. Uh, we have received funding for phase two, and we'll be doing that uh, in, the, in the next year. We'll be expanding on our project and uh, also we'll be testing this uh, with a group of construction workers uh, case scenario. Uh, and then lastly, phase three will be actual commercialization of the project in, in wide scale use, uh, which we will be applying for that process after phase two. These are references, including our uh, post-Hurricane Harvey Respirator Protection Training Program and some of the results that I had mentioned uh, there, um, and, as well as uh, the implementation incorporation of COVID-19 infectious disease protocols that we have done. And uh, funding for this project, uh, just to mention, was through partially through our Southwest Center as well as the NIHS. Um, I will pause here, uh, but thank you for your time and the opportunity uh, to present this uh, topic. Great, thank you, Brett. So next we have uh, Susan Peters at, or uh, maybe we have the next speaker um, will be Susan Peters at Harvard. Good morning, everyone. Today, it is my pleasure to present on the Thriving Workers, Thriving Workplaces study. My name is Susan Peters, and I am the co-PI of the study with Dr. Gregory Wagner at the Center for Work, Health and Wellbeing, a total worker health center of excellence based in Boston at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health in collaboration with Northeastern University, Boston College and MIT. The Center for Work, Health and Wellbeing has been in existence since 2009 under the directorship of Professor Glorian Sorensen. The Thriving Workers, Thriving Workplaces study is one of four research projects that together form the research core for our center. With a focus on worker wellbeing, this project bridges our research studies as well as our outreach core, which informs our research to practice at the center. The Thriving study is a four year project starting in September of this year through to 2026. The Thriving Workers, Thriving Workplaces study main goal is to provide evidence on the determinants of workers thriving with long term goals of informing and evaluating total worker health interventions and workplace and public policies focused on improving worker well-being. So what does thriving mean in the context of work? Formative research that has been completed over the past three years by our centre and led by myself has focused on defining, conceptualising and measuring thriving from work. This concept of thriving from work encapsulates the expanded view of occupational health and safety that is embedded in the total worker health approach with a focus on worker wellbeing. This study supports a vision that work should not only be free of injury and illness, but also health promoting, focusing on how policies, programs and practices can improve the conditions of work so that work contributes to our lives in positive, meaningful and productive ways. In our formative research, we also developed and validated the Thriving From Work questionnaire in a US and South American sample. This has been translated into six languages. This questionnaire was designed to have different versions that could be used for a wide variety of uses. First, we developed a battery of items across 37 attributes of Thriving From Work that can be used as an organizational diagnostic tool. Then from there, we developed both a long 30 item and a short eight item questionnaire that can be used to measure thriving from work as an integrated measure of worker wellbeing. This questionnaire can be used for observational research or as an outcome measure. We can use this questionnaire to measure thriving at the individual level so that we are measuring thriving workers, as well as at the group level 
to measure thriving work groups or thriving workplaces. In the Thriving Workers, Thriving Workplaces study, we will respond to four specific project aims to accomplish the Centre's goals of improving worker wellbeing with a focus on how policies, programs and practices can improve working conditions and reduce disparities. Our first aim is to identify working conditions and worker factors associated with workers thriving. Our second aim is to determine the extent to which working conditions influence changes in workers thriving over time. Our third aim is to determine the extent to which organisational, integrated health and safety policy programs and practices are associated with workers thriving. And our fourth aim is our research to practice aim, to advance workers thriving in the workplace and through public policy and practice. So how will we achieve these aims? The Thriving from Work questionnaire is used as a core measure across our research studies at the centre. As such, this provides a unique opportunity to be able to achieve our specific aims for this project. We will use data collected using administrative data and a survey of both clinical and non-clinical hospital workers through the Boston Hospital Workers Health Study. We'll also use data from the baseline measures collected as part of the Fulfillment Center Intervention Study. In addition, through the Thriving Workers Thriving Workplaces Study, we will collect new data longitudinally with construction workers. Using data collected from research studies across the centre allows us to be able to measure worker wellbeing across different sectors to be responsive to our project as well as our overall centre's goals. If you are interested in using the Thriving From Work questionnaire or want to find out more about the Thriving Workers Thriving Workplaces study, please do not hesitate to connect with me as we learn more about what affects worker wellbeing and how we can improve the working lives of American workers. Thank you. Great, thank you. Now, finally, we have a presentation from Beth Livingston at University of Iowa. Hello, everybody. Um, as a scholar in business management and work family, I've long studied how people manage their flexible work arrangements. I actually started out my PhD work focusing on the management of work and family and on gender and diversity issues, particularly at work. So flexible work arrangements fell squarely in that topic area. Um, so working in and around business schools and human resources programs gave me a very particular insight into how to talk about these issues with managers and business leaders. But COVID really brought the urgency on this issue to a new level. And suddenly there were companies and executives I had spoken to in the past reaching out to me. Um, what could they do to better prepare their workforce for the shift in the future of working arrangements? And um, I am so excited to be partnering with the Healthier Workforce Center of the Midwest, which has allowed me to give this research and my perspectives on this new life um, and take a total worker health lens to this issue that I've been thinking about for many years. So it became clear to us as we were talking through these issues early in the pandemic that business leaders needed to adopt a total worker health perspective to best address their concerns. And also, while total worker health practitioners often needed to understand human resources and strategic management from a business lens, and our partnership has allowed this sort of cross-pollination of expertise to jointly affect well-being and productivity at the same time, and we're focusing particularly on supervisors as this key mechanism for change because they have such a presence in the lives of everyday workers. We are also focusing specifically on the need to consider context when designing and implementing training around remote management. Many, many of the trainings that are already available are one size fits all, but the same training may not be effective in every organization or for every person, which is something my own research has demonstrated time and again, that there are these individual differences and individual relationships at work that can affect the efficacy of trainings around these sorts of multifaceted issues. So we wanted to develop this real evidence-based approach that considered variance in context and across people and organizations. If our goal really was if we want to help people work better and more healthfully when they're not co-located, we needed to do this sort of research first. So 
The project I'm leading has three specific aims. The first is to develop a training for supervisors of remote or hybrid workers that balances the dual goals of well-being and productivity at the same time. Uh, this allows us to demonstrate these, these relationships between these two very important outcomes. The second is, you know, basically it's efficacy. Does the training actually improve supervisor well-being and the well-being of workers? And the third is a really important step because it delves into the how the training works. What's the mechanism here? And that allows us to have multiple levers to be able to affect change and the demonstration of whether these levers and these effects are consistent across contexts. I'm happy to report that the development of this training is almost complete. It's We've been working on it for the past year and we have multiple companies lined up to pilot and test the training who have reached out and said, is it done yet? Is it done yet? Uh, because this is such a pressing issue that companies have right now. Um, overall, managers will complete five asynchronous modules followed by a one hour live Zoom session facilitated by our team and our trained facilitators to practice the strategies that they learned asynchronously. So the modules were developed by our team who are experts in these topical areas and in ed executive education. So we have uh, a lot of expertise in delivering the pedagogical delivery uh, of online education um, and have also been informed by survey research that um, I helped co conduct with the Healthier Workforce Center of the Midwest um, during the course of the pandemic. So our modules include um, uh, introducing the concept of total worker health to, to managers who may not understand what that means, um, uh, modules on building trust in remote teams, engaging remote workers, building conne um, connections and relationships remotely, and managing the unique stressors and well-being issues that affect across the boundaries of remote work. So one of the things that I've really been excited about about this partnership is I feel like it provides a great test case for other types of coordination, whether it's public-private partnerships, research and practice partnerships, or other partnerships of business schools and public health and total worker health practitioners. I think we're demonstrating the real importance of integration across these domains uh, and training students and leaders on these concepts jointly. But I also think it can provide a template for problem solving for other issues that affect and that I'm interested in as a scholar, things like allyship and diversity, equity and inclusion, for instance, or even the role of technology and artificial intelligence um, to make sure that the well-being of the worker is centered. And in a lot of these cases, these voices are not being heard in the development of these technologies and these approaches to management. So I feel like cross-disciplinary partnership are really common buzzwords, but when we do them well, well, I think we can make even more effective and efficient change in employee health and well-being. So thank you. Feel free to reach out if you have any more questions about the research we're doing, or if you want to learn more about the training we're developing, um, you can look us up at the Healthier Workforce Center of the Midwest or beth-livingston at uiowa.edu. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Jennifer Lincoln, and I work at NIOSH in the Office of Agriculture, Safety, and Health. I'm happy to be serving as moderator for this research and outreach quick take session. So during this session, we will hear eight five minute presentations on current research and outreach activities. And this will be followed by a Q&A session with all presenters. Our first presenter, uh, our first set of presenters come from our Centers of Agriculture, Safety and Health. And I welcome Joshua Schaefer from our High Plains Intermountain Center um, to go first. Joshua. Hello, I'm Joshua Schaefer. I just wanna say thank you for the opportunity to present on our research uh, on bioaerosol exposures in the microbiome. This has been a team effort. I'm part of an incredible team, uh, which has really included cross-center collaborations uh, like uh, ERC funded students. Really quick background to help set the stage. Uh, in a previous study, we deployed a high volume cascade impactor in various dairy operations. And from this, we were able to demonstrate that a substantial proportion of particulate mass is present in larger size ranges, spanning 10 to 100 microns in aerodynamic diameter. And when we analyze these different dust samples from the different stages, um, using DNA sequencing technology, we were able to demonstrate that the relative contribution of bacteria was comparable across all four size fractions. Basically, the, the, the smaller particles as well as the larger particles. And you can see this in the heat map in the top right. Uh, and right below that is a stacked bar graph 
where we used shotgun metagenomic sequencing and we were able to characterize different antibiotic resistant genes that are present across these different size fractions as well. And we know that the larger particles tend to deposit in the upper respiratory system, including the nasopharyngeal region. And so these results and these findings were very important uh, and, and, and helped inform our current studies. Two of our current studies focused on uh, Bioaerosol exposures in the microbiome is the one on the left, the evaluation of the effectiveness of a nasal rinse intervention. Uh, this is where we administer hypertonic saline and compare that to a normal tonic saline. Uh, and we're looking at the nasal microbiome. And on the right, we're uh, assessing worker exposures and looking at uh, the microbiome, uh, the resistome or the collection of antibiotic resistant genes, uh, as well as um, viruses, uh, the virome. Uh, and obviously have now included um, SARS-CoV-2 in that analysis. Uh, for the rest of the presentation, I'll be focusing on um, our nasal rinse intervention study. Here's a brief outline of the study. Uh, we are collecting personal bioaerosol samples from dairy workers as well as nasal lavages. Uh, and we're analyzing the different sample sets for the microbiome, or more specifically, bacterial communities. Uh, as well as looking at influenza A, C, D, and coronavirus. Uh, and then we're analyzing the nasal lavages as well for pro-inflammatory pro cytokines. Okay, here are some results from our PCR analysis where we do have a manuscript currently under review. And as you can tell in Table 1, uh, more than two-thirds of our dairy workers uh, at, at across all the different operations um, had molecular evidence of uh, IDV or influenza D which is a newly recognized zoonotic influenza species. And from this, uh, th th these data suggest that uh, this is an occupational exposure in this industry. We also identified concurrent positive dairy worker nasal washes with uh, influenza A and C and D, uh, each of which have been recognized to infect cattle. Uh, we also had eight nasal washes testing positive for both MRSA and influenza virus. In addition to the PCR analysis, we also conducted DNA sequencing on the nasal lavage samples and visual analysis of the taxonomic bar plot in this slide uh, suggests that the dairy workers enrolled in our study have diverse bacterial communities comprising uh, their nasal microbiome, uh, which there is potential for some unique microbiota that we have to take a closer look at. Uh, we also looked at um, diversity and saw a significant difference in beta diversity between those samples, those nasal lavage samples that were positive for methicillin susceptible Staph aureus and those that were negative uh, for methicillin susceptible Staph aureus. Uh, further analysis is needed to determine the nasal microbiome characteristics that influence pathogen carriage and infection in the workplace. Just wanted to quickly point out that the nasal microbiome of dairy workers may play a protective role against opportunistic pathogens. And this was seen in several studies, uh, Shukla et al., Dominguez Diaz et al., and so we are currently comparing our pathogenic results to the nasal microbiome results uh, from the nasal lavage uh, samples collected from dairy workers. We've also analyzed our nasal lavage samples for inflammatory cytokines, and as you can see in the left panel, there is an increase in the anti-inflammatory cytokine IL-10, interleukin-10, across days. Uh, there's also a decrease in the pro-inflammatory cytokine IL-6 across days, and this is observed only in the treatment group, or that, for hypertonic saline as opposed to normal tonic saline. So I'm just over five minutes here. I just want to say that we have a robust analytical plan moving forward to really link the pathogen, microbiome, and inflammatory cytokine results all together. And just want to say thank you to my team. Uh, and just want to give a shout out to my two PhD students, Grant Erlinson and James Seidel, who really helped uh, pull these figures together uh, for this presentation. So uh, thank you again for the opportunity to present. And I will be happy to answer any questions uh, as best I can. Fantastic. That was a um, very interesting presentation. Um, next, we have um, Erica Scott and Julie Sorensen from our Northeast Center. All right. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for attending our session on wearable technology and its potential for tracking worker health and sleep outcomes. My colleague, Dr. Scott, and I are uh, looking forward to 
sharing a quick overview of our experiences with wearable technology. And hopefully by the end of this quick session, we hope to have provided a quick inventory of various wearable options, as well as the pros and cons of capturing worker data in this way. Our initial foray into the use of wearable technology dates back to 2018, actually, when we explored the potential for using actigraphy devices to track life jacket use in fisheries. So this research pointed to the challenges of using, using motion tracking devices, environments where the workplace itself is constantly in motion, such as on board a fishing vessel. So uh, several years later, we launched a study to explore the impact of sleep deprivation in commercial fisheries. And in these efforts, we hope to objectively document the amount of time fishermen were asleep or awake while fishing. While actigraphy is currently the most common method for measuring sleep in clinical settings, our prior research indicated actigraphy readings would be altered by vessel motion and impact the accuracy of sleep data. Uh, other deficits with actigraphy included the inability of these devices to measure sleep stages or brain activity. So to identify other options for tracking sleep at sea, we turned to George Mason University researcher, Dr. Lee McHugh Weil. So she partnered with us on this research and uh, she's a naval engineer with a background in fisheries research and technology development. So to answer the question of how to capture sleep data at sea, uh, Dr. McHugh Weil identified a number of commercially available sleep tracking devices and then worked with fishermen to trial these devices while at sea on multi-day fishing trips. Um, and these devices were used, uh, th they use various data points for tracking sleep and offered a number of advantages and disadvantages to the researcher. Um, several of the devices were also used uh, collectively uh, or all at the same time to assess the sim similarity of sleep data between the devices and also to validate data outputs. Fishermen were also tracked to tra asked to track their sleep in a sleep diary. So results from Dr. Weil's study will hopefully be published soon. However, as illustrated in this table, each device has a number of noteworthy considerations such as battery life, data storage, durability, safety, and ability to track sleep stages. Dr. McHugh Weil also found that fishermen were generally receptive to the idea of using these devices to track their own health metrics, but did have concerns about sharing this data with others. Perhaps most importantly, her at-sea trials demonstrated that while sleep, sleep wake times generally agreed across devices, there were discrep discrepancies noted in sleep stages, which identifies the need for further studies on how to actually improve sleep track tracking details on commercial fishing vessels or vessels of any type. I'd like to hand things over to my colleague, Erica. Thanks, Julie. Hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Excellent. So we're going from sleep to cardiovascular risk factors here, and we've been working with a cohort of logging workers in Maine for the past few years on gathering baseline health and safety information. And cardiovascular risk factors, in particular hypertension, um, is a very prevalent concern among mechanized logging operators. So we undertook a pilot study uh, hoping to assess those cardiovascular risk factors in a more detailed way. And we were very happy to partner with Dr. Insu Kim of the University of Connecticut Health Science uh, Health Center and also part of CPH NU um, and did much like the fishing study, comparing different uh, wearable technology that we could then look at for uh, those uh, CVD risk factors. And presented here on the screen, you can see uh, a continuous blood pressure armband that was developed uh, in Dr. Kim's lab. The next is the hexoskin, which was also mentioned for the fishing study. And then lastly was the Empatica E4. So as Julie mentioned, you know, assessing wearability and comfort and uh, worker acceptance was really, really important here. And you can see across the bottom of the screen, uh, some of the, the pros and cons um, that were reported by the loggers involved in this pilot study. So things about comfort um, and you know, what they were used to wearing essentially. So in the interest of time, we're going to just highlight some of the user considerations and device challenges in case anyone is thinking about undertaking um, data, health data collection using wearables, whether they're commercially available or uh, laboratory uh, built. So in uh, environments that involve a lot of movement, you can imagine that entanglement risks were a particular uh, 
of particular interest specifically for the fishing workers. Um, durability, especially for outdoor workers, uh, was a key factor in our decision making on what we chose. Uh, comfort, and as Julie points out here, especially for sleep studies, um, can they sleep in their normal way overnight or will that disturb the, um, the data collection? And privacy concerns, you know, I think in this day and age, of course, um, are we tracking just their health or other things? I think that did come up multiple times. Um, the device challenges themselves, as Julie said, battery life, data storage, um, the ability to download data, um, whether internet connectivity is required, we're working often in remote settings that have absolutely no cell service or internet anywhere <laughs> close by, or if you're out at sea for several days or longer. So a lot of these things to, uh, to just put in the back of your mind, depending on the worker group that you may uh, be involved with. So there are differences, obviously, in durability of these devices, and an important piece that we were considering is access to raw data. Some of the commercially available devices have their proprietary algorithms that we're unable to sort of unlock. And the other piece is how complicated are these devices to set up for the worker? Can you ship it to the worker and they can put it on their wrist, or is it more complicated in terms of um, placing uh, electrodes in the right spots or positioning the shirts uh, well? And then sizing in particular. I know for the Hexoskin and Aura, for example, you have to have a ring size or a shirt size that needs to be quite well uh, matched to the worker in order to get the best quality data. And then lastly, everything is evolving very quickly. So from year to year, what's available is changing. Um, the cost varies quite widely depending on what you're looking at. And um, you know, the basic pieces that we would recommend is assessing what will workers accept and actually wear and can do their jobs effectively in. Um, and then we're always looking um, in the next moments on that new technology. And then again, taking out, as Julie mentioned, the influence of the work environment on the worker. So the vessel motion, for example, or as we've done in the logging studies, the motion of a feller buncher or a forwarder, for example, and subtracting that out. So um, going to the last slide here, we just wanna um, thank you for the interest and the opportunity to present and obviously funding information there and a huge thank you to our team here at the Northeast Center for both projects. Great, uh, thank you, Julie and Erica. Now we'll hear from our colleagues from uh, CPWR. And the first presentation is a recording from Babak Mamarian. So let's go ahead and hear that. Hello, I am Babak Mamarian, CPWR's Director of Exposure Control Technologies Research. Today, I will give a quick update on findings of our research project that aims to enhance the quality of job hazard analysis and pretest planning in the construction industry, specifically in electrical work. I should mention that we are conducting this study in close collaboration with electrical unions, associations, and also electrical contractors of various sizes. As the starting point of this study, in collaboration with 15 electrical contractors, we identified 14 high-risk electrical tasks and operations, and also explored work factors and project attributes that create hazardous working condition for electrical workers on job sites. A manuscript on these findings was accepted for publication by the Professional Safety Journal, and it will be in print in August of 2022. To create a better understanding of shortcomings and challenges of conducting job hazard analysis, we initially reviewed 30 sample JHA documents gathered from different sources. And then we interviewed 23 construction safety and health professionals representing 17 companies to identify effective practices and interventions to enhance the quality of pretest planning. We published findings of this part of the work earlier this year that I have provided the link to this article here on this slide. One major gap in conducting job hazard analysis and pre-task planning in construction is a lack of task-specific information, mainly from construction workers' perspective who perform the actual task. So to fill this gap in this study, we conduct one-on-one -on -one interviews with electrical workers on job sites, and we ask questions about different aspects of the task they perform, including physical loads, mental loads, environmental factors, frustration, and a few other questions. So far, we have conducted 80 
interviews with electrical workers on job sites, and the goal is to increase this number in the next few months. As the result of these field studies, we have been able to analyze 18 electrical tasks. And it should be noted that we try to study each task on their different types of projects. For instance, if we interview workers for overhead conduit installation, we try to repeat these interviews with workers who perform the same task on, let's say, commercial buildings, data center projects, or warehouses. So this way, we'll be able to provide more comprehensive content for each task that we study. To make this information available and help construction practitioners improve the quality of pre-task planning and also electrical worker training, we have developed electrical task challenges and solutions documents. Each document contains task-specific challenges, an image for each condition, and also some recommended solutions. So far, we have developed 33 ready-for-impact task-specific documents for different electrical tasks on their various project types. Here is one example. These documents are organized based on task and project type. In this case, the task was an overhead conduit installation on a commercial building project. Here we have provided the summary of the task and the location of the project. And in the following pages, we see challenges raised by workers associated with one picture to better represent the situation, and also some recommendations and suggestions categorized based on the hierarchy of control. These resources and these forms will be made available through CPWR's research to practice and communications channels and users will be able to download and customize them based on their project needs. At the end, I would like to acknowledge my colleagues on this project, Chris Lee and Sarah Brooks, both with CPWR, and thank you so much for your time. Okay, fantastic. Now we'll hear from Amber Trueblood from CPWR. Welcome, Amber. Thank you. Hi, yes, my name is Amber Trueblood. I am with CPWR. I am currently the director of the data center. Today, I'm just going to highlight a few of our products and do that real quick here in less than five minutes. So CPWR currently has three products in our data center. So the first is our construction chart book, which has been around since the 90s. Our data bulletins, which came out in 2020 data dashboards, which came out in 2021. Today, I'm going to really focus on our data bulletins and data dashboards. I do wanna highlight that all of our products are free at cpwr.com and they all have underlying data files and image files that are readily available. So our data bulletins are published six times a year and focus on one key topic area or an emerging area such as COVID-19. The data bulletins, uh, again, are largely short reports. We try to synthesize complex uh, surveillance data into the major key findings. So they include approximately 12 charts. I don't know who is controlling me. That is not me. Um, with So they have 12 charts with a brief introduction, summary paragraphs for each chart, a discussion, and then we highlight the key findings. And so we really try to synthesize this down in an easy to digest format. As you can see from the list on the slide, we cover a variety of topics and we try to fully address the needs of the construction industry. So in the past year, we've looked at mental health, fatal and non-fatal injuries, our OSHA inspections, and then looking at the impact of COVID-19. Most recently, we looked at a two-year uh, review of the impact of COVID-19. So that just came out this month, if you're interested. And all of our products are linked on the page here, or you can use the QR code to go check those out. Our next product are data dashboards. Again, these came out in May, 2021. These provide information beyond our data bulletins with interactive charts and downloadable data files. And so each one um, has a set of charts that are available. And then most of them have filters that you can then tailor the charts to your specific needs. These are updated as new data is available. 
which is really nice. You don't have to wait for us to come back on a report or wait for us to update any sort of data. It just happens as soon as the data is available on our internal schedule. These data dashboards can be either one sheet or storyboard format. And storyboard just means that there's multiple sheets on a related topic. They either correspond directly to a data bulletin. So for example, our mental health data bulletin had a corresponding data dashboard that dug a little bit deeper than we could go in the actual data bulletin. Because again, data bulletins restricted to 12 charts, try to keep it short and sweet, but there's a lot of good information out there. So we published a corresponding data dashboard and that's similar with a lot of our topics. We also have standalone dashboards and those tend to cover uh, topics that don't make it into a data bulletin or have historically gone into the construction chart book. At this time, we have 19 dashboards currently available and we tend to add one uh, to three dashboards every two months, so it's ever growing. Up next, I'm going to show you, this is what a story dashboard would look like. And so as you can see, we try to present an easy to digest format, some charts here. There are filters that are available. Um, they're showing a little wonky on the screen, but characteristic age years, if you were to actually click that, you could go to ethnicity, education, and different characteristics on the physical dashboard. On the same dashboard, we have a second tab at the top for employment and COVID-19 trends. And so we split from our general employment trends to specific pandemic trends, because that was a very hot topic for our industry and understanding the actual impact of the pandemic on employment. So I told you I was going to highlight two products. Uh, I snuck in a third one. Up next is our interactive chart book. So you heard that the chart book has been around since the 1990s. In 2018, we published the first e-chart book. So it was electronically available. It wasn't just a standalone PDF. You could interact a little bit more with the underlying data. Up next, we're actually going to use the dashboard format to build on that. And so as you can see, I have an example uh, interactive chart book here. It is built on the same dashboard format. So you see a chart. However, we've now added text. And so you will actually have an introduction and then our key findings. So it'll be formatted as a cross between sort of the data bulletins and our dashboards. And it will cover all of the same topics that has historically been covered in the construction chart book. So that is upcoming. And what's really cool is as you change the filters, the text is going to change. So if you don't want US statistics, you can go, I only want Washington and everything in blue will update to the state of Washington. Upcoming products, we have our transportation injuries in the construction industry, which will be coming out in September, as well as three dashboards that come out in August and September. So check back frequently at cpwr.com to see what we're up to. So that was a lot of information in a short time. I hope you guys take the time to go through and browse cpwr.com. In addition to my materials, we have a lot of great information for the construction industry. Thank you. Thank you, Amber. Now we'll go ahead and move to our representatives, representatives from our ERCs. And first up is Susan Buchanan from the University of Illinois, Chicago. Susan, are you there? Sorry about that. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yes, we can hear you now. I'm not sure what happened there. Um, and my, my video is incorrect video, so I'm not going to worry about that. Anyway, hi, everybody. Um, I'm the PI of the ERC in Chicago, the Great Lakes Center for Occupational Health and safety. And I jumped at the chance to um, present to you the some of the outreach activities that we um, carried out during the pandemic because we were very, very busy. Preeti Praytap, you see list, listed there, she is the director of our CE and outreach program and led most of the efforts. And you can see the other team members there from our ERC in Chicago. Okay, control, sorry about that. Um, the quote of our mission for our entire Great Lakes Center really resonates with our outreach program, which is that every person has the right to healthy work, a job that pays a living wage, a workplace that is safe, a work environment where everyone is treated with respect, 
and qualified occupational environmental health professionals who advocate for their health. These bullets below show some of the groups that we have worked with during the pandemic and that we've had relationships with for the last 20, 25 years. And that was really key to our success during the pandemic because we already had these relationships established. And I'm going to just give you three or four examples of some of our outreach work during the pandemic. This first one is the Community Navigators Project that we worked with um, with the Chicago Workers Collaborative, which is a very active workers' rights group on the south side of Chicago. And we helped them develop and disseminate COVID-19 related health and safety guidelines through this labor brigade of COVID-19 worker navigators. And we organized various trainings um, that they participated in. We trained them on the basics of COVID-19 and then they went on, 52 workers went on to receive NIEHS certification for essential and returning worker training related to COVID-19. We had workers that completed a, a virtual computer literacy training program, 29 workers then went out and provided 32 hours of outreach on the essential worker protection program through their own networks. We also worked with the group Black Workers Matter, specifically at some industrial bakeries in Chicago. And we, they approached us for help and input with this report card that they put together. And they developed it as a tool to democratize COVID reporting and policy making. And the issue was that in these industrial bakeries, the workers were finding some very unsafe practices related to COVID-19 and even some deaths from COVID-19. This reporting card was designed to identify and grade the COVID hazards, compliance with CDC guidelines and overall conditions. So the members collected print and digital COVID-19 report cards from these sites. And they also organized and hosted a vaccination pop-up for black, brown and white essential workers right next to a Bimbo's commercial bakery in Cicero, which is a part of Chicago. We also worked with the Independent Drivers uh, Guild and we designed a survey and trained some of the staff from Independent Drivers Guild to conduct this survey of the drivers to identify challenges that they had during the pandemic, how the virus was affecting their health and well being, and what was being done to prevent the spread of the COVID, uh, of the coronavirus. And, and this information led to the development of a mental health and wellness program. And on the right, you can see a flyer inviting um, rideshare workers to a wellness fair sponsored by the Independent Drivers Guild. Our Great Lakes Center also hosts OHIP interns each summer. And the two summers during the pandemic, our, our interns worked with the Temp Worker Union Alliance Project and the Chicago Collaborative Network to document the experiences of temp workers during the pandemic in the summer of 2020. Actually, I think that was just one summer of interns. I'm, I don't, I'm not sure we had them in 2019 because of the, the onset of the pandemic. Anyway, they put together a report uh, entitled, We Don't Have the Luxury to Work from Home, based on interviews with 120 temp workers. And then that last bullet shows that these this, this summer, the interns are working on updating this COVID-19 safety protocol survey for workplaces in 2022. We had multiple events, remote events, we called teletowns or town hall meetings and trainings, and they were just um, online presentations live. We called them teletowns because there was a, a real uh, large Q&A section built into all of these. So we made it, you know, just really a, a venue for people to ask their questions about the infection, vaccines and prevention. And these bullets show some of the organizations we worked with, including the last one, the Unite Here Chicago Hospitality Institute. We conducted trainings for hotel housekeepers way back at the beginning because hotels in downtown Chicago were being offered to hospital workers. So they didn't have to go home to their families and potentially give the, vac the virus to their family members. And so we trained the hotel housekeepers on um, safety. 
And then this past spring, we worked uh, with O'Hare airport concessions workers uh, hosting multiple trainings to get all the, uh, air, the airport concessions workers trained. And this photo, the slide here shows uh, a chef who is a trainer, a teacher at the Chicago Hospitality Institute for Unite Here. And I gave a section on the COVID-19 vaccine and infection. And then he gave a section of the presentation on safety for these concessions workers. So COVID-19 safety in, the, in food prep. And then finally, my last slide is just some pictures of in-person events that we conducted during the pandemic uh, in a more advocacy realm. The two photos on the left show Rolando Favela, one of our staff members. Uh, the first one is attending a Warehouse Workers for Justice advocacy event on worker safety around the Delta, Delta variant. And then the middle one is a more recent immigrant workers' rights advocacy event sponsored by those various worker groups listed underneath all in the Chicago area. And the one on the right is a picture from the Independent Drivers Guild Health and Wellness Fair attended by um, Rolando Favela uh, on our team. And he provided some COVID-19 information. So that's a really quick uh, five minutes. Mm -hmm. Our outreach activities, I'd be happy to answer any questions at the end. Thanks. Thank you very much. And now we'll hear from uh, Kermit Davis from the University of Cincinnati. Yeah, so I'm gonna just talk about one brief uh, part portion of our, our outreach um, during the, the, particularly during the, the, uh, pand the COVID pandemic. Uh, and th this really concentrated on the work from home uh, workers and uh, dealing with uh, a, a sudden shift um, with respect to uh, their, their work environment ergonomics. And so one of the things that we found um, early on with some of our research is that la laptops were, were widely used. 80% uh, of the people were sent home, more than 80%. Uh, were sent home with the laptop and that was it. Um, most people sat within the kitchen tables, counters, um, or the workstations, which are very different than what our normal office workstations are. So we started developing uh, many outreach um, initiatives, uh, trying to help individuals both within the university as well as uh, local companies. And we developed um, a, a very basic assessment uh, where we'd have people send in um, two pictures, one from directly behind them and one directly in fr uh, from the side. Uh, this allowed us to, to really identify what some of the ergonomic concerns are. And it was very quickly became uh, a quick um, identification of the main, main concerns. Um, and I'll talk to those a little bit about that right now. Uh, first, uh, you know, there are some concerns with dual monitors. Uh, people would hook up external key or external monitors to their, their laptops, uh, but oftentimes would, would put the, the main one off to the side. So one of the things you want to make sure you do is put the, the monitor directly in front of you. Otherwise, you'll be turning constantly or twisted uh, to one direction or the other. And you actually do not want your monitor split screen right in front of you because you need to make sure that uh, the primary one is in front of you and you want to have that other one off to the side. Uh, so we were seeing a lot of uh, effects of that in, in these makeshift uh, uh, workstations. Uh, we also saw a lot of uh, hard edges and seating concerns, uh, no arms or arms that were unadjustable or dining room table chairs. Uh, that don't have arms with oftentimes led to a hard surface on the front and we provided recommendations uh, to to eliminate these th these issues with towels or pillows um, those type of things not using the backrest is another big concern oftentimes in, at home uh, often one of the big things with the laptop is that it's uh, put it, that the monitor is too low and whether that's a standing uh, one at the countertop or in this case, a, a sit stand, uh, that the necks uh, end up being flexed forward and you end up with uh, you know, uh, neck issues and upper back problems. Um, so this is another concern. Uh, we also saw a lot of non-traditional workstations, anywhere from the bed, the couches, um, that, that put people in non-optimal non positions. 
And one of the big things is, as I said, 80% were sent home with laptops. Um, that has a built-in monitor that is, you know, placed on the counter or on your lap that is is meant to, is is too low. Uh, that causes uh, the neck to be bent forward. Smaller keyboards uh, that that result in awkward arm postures. Uh, built-in mouse that requires rapid hand movements. Um, and one of the biggest things uh, that you know, these these laptops uh, were designed for to be one or two hour devices, not six, seven, eight, nine hours working at home or even in office. Uh, so one of the big things is, is you need an external monitor and lapt it lapt a lapt uh, external laptop, and as well um, you can put that on on a, a book or 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 a box that can raise up the the monitor. Um, and, and the external um, keyboard and mouse um, that, that can allow you to uh, type and, 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 and use a, a more neutral postures oftentimes is, is also critical. The key is that to, to get it into the right postures and neutral. So one of the big things is that we conducted over 90 office uh, assessments and recommendations um, oftentimes we didn't like go and try to recommend real expensive uh, uh, fixes. Uh, They're really uh, cheap. We developed a tip sheet uh, that would, was allowed to give the best um, uh, few frugal um, type of, of ergonomics that you could provide at home. We've been continue to give presentations to various office uh, office uh, worker groups. And uh, one of the bigger, more outreach type of, of things that we've done is we, we, I've, we've conducted over 15 media interviews on, on this work and I'll continue to do that even to this, um, within the last couple of weeks, I've done another one. So this continues to be a big issue. Obviously, we talked yesterday of, of, of work from home with many other factors, but you know, one of the biggest ones has been the, the poor ergonomic situations that uh, many of these workers have at home. And so that gives it a quick summary of one of the uh, outreach uh, activities that we have going on. Fantastic, Carmen. Thank you for giving that update. Now we're going to move to our uh, Total Worker Health Centers, and we're going to first hear, uh, watch a video from um, Natalie Schwatka. Hi everyone, I'm Natalie Schwatka. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Colorado Institute's Medical Campus, and I'm affiliated with our Center for Health, Work and Environment, and NIOSH Center of Excellence in Total Worker Health. On behalf of my co-lead on this project, Courtney Welton Mitchell, I am happy to be talking about our mental health emergency preparedness for the school workforce project. We all know that emergency preparedness is critical for schools. All schools are required to have plans, but they're typically developed at the district level without much teacher and staff involvement. This results in limited knowledge and buy-in. What's also missing is planning for mental health, not just physical health. And most districts are not integrating mental health via psychological preparedness into their plans. This includes ensuring teachers and staff have the knowledge of threats that may occur, probable psychological reactions, and adaptive responses to mitigate risk. We have a two-year research project to develop a mental health emergency preparedness training and evaluate it among six schools. We have just completed focus groups, interviews, and drill observations needed to inform the curriculum and are beginning the process of finalizing the curriculum this summer. And in the fall, we'll be evaluating the training with six, six match schools in Colorado. We are in the process of finalizing our analysis of the qualitative data, but preliminarily we have found some very insightful findings around seven themes. And I don't have time to go over all of them, but I would like to emphasize four broad points about these themes. First, there are a lot of different kinds of emergencies that schools have to prepare for, but active harm or hazards are on top of mind. Second, schools are drilling for active harm or situations, but there's a concern about whether they're drilling in the right way. For example, are drills realistic enough, and do they cover enough scenarios? Third, teachers and staff need help preparing psychologically for how they're going to react during drills and during actual emergencies. Fourth, teachers and staff want and need to have a role in preparedness, and they need peer support mechanisms. Given the salience of active harm or hazards, we observe several drills at the elementary, middle, and high school levels. 
all was a, a very different experience, as you can imagine, based on the kinds of students and the age of students that are that are there at each of the school levels. But um, broadly, we see that they can either instill confidence or anxiety or both at the same time. Teachers noted a tension between um, preparing for realistic scenarios versus preparing in a way that's best for people's well-being. Drills can be very um, triggering, and so a lot of schools will drill in a way that's, you know, it's announced, they're, you know, very controlled, um, but they may not reflect what's actually going to happen in an emergency. Teachers also have challenges managing their classroom, their students, when, when drills or emergencies are happening. And some teachers in particular may need some extra support if they've had a history of incident exposure in the past. In summary, we aim to give teachers ways to psychologically prepare for emergencies, but also give them the support system they need to ensure that these strategies are effective. And this is best summarized by what we heard from one high school teacher in one of our focus groups. They basically noted that it's one thing to be told and be prepared to have training about that, but it's another thing to actually have those supports there when you, when you need them. So um, at the end of our project, we aim to create a toolkit for mental health emergency preparedness for schools in both um, in-person and online formats to help schools assess, implement, and evaluate their training content independently. And we will deliver this through Health Links, which is our center's signature outreach program. Thanks so much for your time. I'm happy to chat offline if you have any other questions. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. And now we'll have our, our last presenter of the session, um, Nicole Bowles. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to present ongoing work examining the impact of a firefighter's work schedule on their health, wellness, and safety. Our project I lead is part of the Oregon Healthy Workforce Center and as an assistant professor in the Oregon Institute of Occupational Health Sciences here at OHSU. Um, and thanks to funding from NIOSH Total Worker Health Program and funds from the Division of Consumer and Business Services um, of the State of Oregon. This project started in 2018 when the Wellness Committee from uh, Portland's Firefighter Union approached us about work schedules, a growing concern um, among many of their firefighters who have been experiencing increased workloads as a result of increased call volume over the last decade and without um, an increased number of firefighters. This is illustrated by the graph on the right here, where you'll note um, the number of calls that Portland Fire and Rescue has experienced over the last decade. And in reference to 2008, um, the number of calls for Portland here at the gray asterisk has notably increased, whereas the call volume um, for Portland, the red boxes um, has remained pretty stagnant or even decreased over the last 10 years or so. Um, these levels are paralleled by the number of calls on the national level, where you, uh, as noted in the black triangles, and similarly, uh, the number of full-time FTE or full-time number of firefighters um, nationally has remained pretty much the same. With increased calls and uh, work staff staying the same, overall the workload and overall occupational burden has increased um, on average for an individual firefighter. This includes both regular or more traditional occupational burdens, such as exposure to smoke or chemicals or lifting heavy objects, but also increasingly sleep loss as, the, um, as opportunities to sleep while on shift has decreased. When examining the impact, um, yeah, there you go. Um, when examining the impact of this sleep loss as part of focus groups among Portland Fire and Rescue when they were working a 24-48 hour shift, it was clear that sleep loss impacted them not only at work, but also at home as depicted by this representative quote. You go home and you're not well rested and you're asked, where are we going, uh, where are we going to dinner tonight? And it seems like such an, ins an insignificant question, but that's when a lot of people shut down and they just don't talk. And what's important to your significant other, you don't care about. Then that creates some tension, which goes on in a lot of different directions like divorce. Um, so again, this is just a representative quote, but probably about a hundred um, similar quotes that represent this theme that came out in these focus groups. So are our alternative schedules the answer? Again, that prior quote came from a firefighter working the 2448 schedule. So that's one day on, two days off, one day on, two days off, and one day on. 
In order to increase firefighter morale and arguably to increase recovery at home, firefighters have been moving to schedules that afford them more consecutive time off, but often at the expense of a 48 hour shift. So that is two consecutive shifts. One such schedule is the 1323, so changing connotation, um, but that's the lingo firefighters use, so that's what I'm using here. That's one day on, three days off, two days on, so that two day, 48 hour schedule, and then three days off. Is that a better? Uh, solution. Based on uh, focus groups with 1323 three firefighters, they argue that subjectively it does improve morale and it does improve um, at least one metric, work-family conflict. As noted here in a representative quote, again, many um, based on hours of interviews, similar sentiments is this one, I'm definitely not as short with my kids. You get off shift and even if it was on the second day, your kids would do something that were mildly irritating and you would just, at least I would just go off the deep end. And I am way, way better than I was six months ago before the schedule change. And with that being said, I am more involved with my kids than I was six months ago. Like right, sorry, the little icons on top of that quote. Um, okay, I can move that, sorry. Um, like right now I coach both of my, kids basketball teams, which is like every day, three to four hours after school, and I still feel great. Um, looking at quantitative data from our pilot study um, with firefighters, which included daily surveys over at least two weeks and administered to both firefighters and their significant others, we found that time on shift increased family interfere, uh, family interfering, work interfering, interfering with family, while time off shift reduced work interfering 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 with family. The latter was consistent with statements from focus groups um, with the 1323 firefighters. However, from the pilot study, we are unable to determine if the benefits from increased time off made up for the, determ um, the detriments uh, of increased time on shift. So overall, what is the impact on firefighters health? Um, the latter is currently being assessed in our full study examining the 2448 and the 1323 schedules. Um, we're doing this both prospectively currently with Portland Fire and Rescue. Um, we've been studying them since the beginning of this year before they made a change um, from the 2448 to the 1323 schedule in March. Um, in May and June, we acutely assessed the impacts of this new schedule, and then we'll study them one more time at the end of the year before they vote on which schedule to adopt at the beginning of the year. And hopefully they'll use the data we're collecting on sleep, safety, cardiovascular risk, um, and stress, including work family conflict, um, in order to inform their decision on which schedule to adopt long-term. We're also uh, more broadly examining these two schedules cross-sectionally in different departments in order to help inform the national debate over work schedule and the impact on firefighters' health. Um, I'd like to thank my team, which includes um, brilliant minds from Oregon Health and Science University, as well as Portland State University, and my research um, staff. And your time, thank you. <laughs>